podcast. Look, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. I'm sorry I can't be with you in, in, in person uh, today. And I just wanted to say thank you to Carlos and also to Professor Mazzucato for the uh, inspiring presentation. E each time I hear Professor Mazzucato, I, I learn a little bit more. Um, and I think it, it, it sets an excellent background drop for what, what I want to, to, to present very briefly. Uh, to, today, and what I what I want to do is perhaps draw attention to some of the problems that we we see that the, these are the big problems that we need policy uh, to solve. Because of course, policy, uh, as Professor Matsukato, needs a directionality, and the directionality is based on the societal challenges uh, that we're seeing. Now, I want to put it in a uh, cohesion perspective uh, and really just draw. Uh, some of the, uh, uh, the 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 key the key uh, the key messages from the cohesion report. It's a 300-page report. Um, uh, I'd invite you all to have a look at it. But I think there are some 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 big messages coming out of this. And I'm going to identify around five or six six major major challenges that we we see, uh, and they're very much linked to what both Carlos and Professor Matsukato uh, presented. Now, the, the, fir the first big challenge, and I think this is something that we've seen growing across Europe since the crisis um, of 2008-2009, and uh, is the emergence of what might be called development traps. And this is essentially parts of Europe that in terms of growth and development are simply stuck. Uh, they are in the same position they were uh, ten, 10 years ago. Now, this is a a rather complicated map, which which tries to to, to essentially visualise this, uh, and, and shows that in addition to the the areas that we would think about being stuck in the south of Italy, certain parts of of Greece or Spain, there are other regions of Europe as well which are which which are stuck. Now, this really raises a question, which I'll come back to the end uh, of my my presentation about Europe's growth. And you know, do we want to have a growth model which essentially says there are some places which are going to contribute more to Europe's growth, where there will be more opportunities, or do we want to have a more balanced model for development? The answer for us in terms of cohesion objectives are, are clear. We need to have some kind of model of balanced development. And if we want to do that, the question then is how do we do it? How do we address the problems that these places are facing? If I could have the next slide. Now, part of this story, um, is the fact that there is a growing innovation divide in Europe. Uh, and this is in terms of performance of both the public and private sector. And the less developed parts of Europe have seen their innovation performance worsen over time. But this is also a phenomenon that we're seeing within more developed uh, member states, where the capacity to create and apply new ideas is becoming more and more ter territorially uh, divided. Now. Here again, this is a, a policy choice that we need to take in, in Europe. Um, but I think our, our, our conviction is, is as we shift increasingly to a knowledge-based economy, uh, everywhere we need to be able to innovate. So this is perhaps a second feature. A third feature is the differences in quality of administration. And, and you know, this is important because it, it indicates the capacity uh, to, um, to, to um, so I, I think my PowerPoint uh, has been, th th there's a bit of a problem with it. I'm not sure if everybody can, 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 see, can see the PowerPoint. Um, um, but the, the point I wanted to make here is that the, uh, the capacity to implement uh, projects uh, to implement policies will depend on the capacity uh, at an institutional level. And, and here again, in, across Europe, we see significant uh, differences in administrative capacity in terms of the quality of governance, and indeed, an issue which is increasingly important, uh, the rule of law. So this is a, th a, third, a third challenge we need to address. If I could have the next slide. Sorry, could you could you switch the next slide, please? 
we have the next slide. So it's a uh, transition to uh, carbon I, neutral I, I, economy. I, I, I still see. Okay, transition to carbon neutral economy. Thank you. Um, next major challenge transition to carbon neutral economy. The map on the right shows the regions which are most intensive in fossil fuel uh, emissions. Uh, we have launched the, uh, the Just Transition Fund as part of the Just Transition Mechanism. Uh, we know that there will be significant costs associated with the transition to a climate neutral economy, uh, but we're just starting. We're just starting the process. Um, the Just Transition Fund fo focuses on uh, mainly on fossil fuels, but we know there are other sectors which are going to be fundamentally tra transformed across Europe as part of our, our shift to, to a more climate friendly economy. Final, final major challenge, and this is something which we are only just starting to talk about, is demographic change. Europe is a demographically, and will be a demographically challenged continent. Um, we are aging faster than many parts of the world. But many regions in Europe are particularly touched by this phenomenon. Um, and it is projected by 2040 that uh, one in two Europeans will live uh, in, a, in, a, in a shrinking region. Uh, now, this is going to be a major challenge uh, because demography is a very heavy trend, which is very difficult to affect by policy. Therefore, the question will be, how do we put together policies that take account of these demographic changes, um, but at the same time, uh, don't break our system of, 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 of a single market, uh, of dynamism, of uh, innovation and economic growth. So these are all, let's say, long-term heavy policy trends, but at the same time, we're seeing an emerging set of crises. Um, now, most clearly, um, we saw the effects of the, of, of the COVID uh, crisis. We're seeing the tragic effects of the, um, uh, of, of the uh, unprovoked war in Ukraine, um, in Ukraine itself, but also the spillover effects into Europe. Now, these are asymmetric shocks which Europe uh, has faced that we have had to uh, address uh, in part through uh, the next generation EU, but also through existing instruments like uh, cohesion policy. Uh, and in this case, in the case of the COVID crisis, we saw that the impact was very, very heavily felt in, in many of our less developed regions, but also in the earlier stages in, 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 southern, in southern Europe. Uh, and we see now the effects of, of the Ukraine crisis. Now, this is also a, a perhaps a, 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 key, a key policy issue for us, is what is the balance between our, our efforts to address the longer term structural features and the need to address these asymmetric shocks? This is not the only asymmetric shock which uh, uh, which is coming, health, war, but equally we may see strong effects in terms of uh, macroeconomic policy over the coming months and years if we have a very sharp tightening, uh, for example, of, of monetary policy. So a few issues to reflect on, and certainly this is part of the debate that our commissioner wanted to, to launch at the cohesion report. The first, the first, the first big question is what what is the place cohesion in the context of European integration, uh, where we have problems in terms of economic integration, but we also have phenomena of political polarization, questions about the European model, opposition to further European integration. But more broadly, what is the role in the European growth model? Are, are, we, are we, let's say, pursuing a model uh, of growth at all costs? where we depend on the spillovers from large cities and, and big companies to the rest of the economy? Or do we need to think a little bit more about the linkages uh, with cities uh, and regions and more peripheral areas? As I mentioned before, how do we get the balance right between the structural challenges that we see and we know we will have to address and the ability to anticipate the kind of asymmetric crisis that we have seen emerge over the last two years? The link between money and reforms. We have seen this uh, question posed very clearly in the context of the next generation EU. We saw the, uh, the, diff the, the stark differences in, in the quality of governance. Perhaps we need to pay more attention to this in cohesion policy. And then I think perhaps just to, to finish, 
a little bit to echo Thomas Bobbin's question to Professor Matsukata. What is the place of, of policies which focus on regions and cities and subnational governments in all of this process? Uh, what is the balance we need to get between the efforts that are made at national level to address these challenges and the efforts that are made at subnational uh, and regional? So with that, uh, I'm finished and I, I look forward to the next question. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much. We are not allowing any questions for Peter yet because Peter will stay with us for the debate that you organize here right after a short break. So, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I suggest 10 minutes break and then we reconvene in the room for the debate and Peter uh, will be happy to have you with us also, even though still online. So, 10 minutes break and welcome back to the room at 10.41. Thank you.